So let's look at measurements in chemistry. Actually, uh, it should just say measurements because what we're going to discuss in this chapter is applicable to any of the sciences. These are, these are common uh, agreed upon uh, methods and definitions for uh, all the sciences. Anytime you take a measurement, this stuff is good for anyone. So if you have the hankering <laughs> of physics course, then it uh, could be one step ahead. Okay. Um, that's just everything we're uncovering the chapter, so I'm not going to stop here. All right. <clears throat> uh, sooner or later, uh, every science takes some type of measurement. Um, you can have what we call qualitative uh, descriptive terms. For any observation in the natural world. And it's on the, on the order of uh, just what are your senses taking in? You know, does it smell? Uh, do you see a color change? Do you see anything else that strikes your eyes as odd or different? Um, it may, you may hear something, right? These are all qualitative. What we're talking about here is quantitative. When you take a measurement, you have two components. You have what they call the scalar or the number and the unit or how big is it? Without those two, your measurement is suspect. In other words, I could say, um, let's see, I'm 71. Right. Do you know what that means? It could mean I'm 71 years old. Not yet. I'm pushing it, but not yet. I'm 71 inches tall. That's what it means, but I didn't say inches. So that leaves out some information that would help you understand what that number means. So in every measurement, you've got a number and a unit. Uh, and the unit tells you what the scale is. If we, if we say, now these are exaggerated, right? That's a lot bigger than a centimeter. But comparison between a millimeter and a centimeter, that's accurate. The ratio is, this is about a tenth of that. <clears throat> um, the, the unit will tell you how big the, uh, the number one means. So if we say one millimeter, it means that. If we say one centimeter, it means that. <clears throat> and you'll notice also that, uh, just keep this in the back of your mind for now, as the size of the unit increases, if you're talking about, all right, let me back up. Uh, if I didn't say this yet, I'll say it now. Nature just does what it does. And it's our job to make sense of it. So if you're talking about some uh, measurement of something uh, and you say this object right, is is this long whatever it happens to be if you change the unit of measure it doesn't change the object you're still talking about the same thing so that being the case if we say this is well i don't know maybe uh 10 centimeters Okay, if it's 10 centimeters long, then if I change the unit of measure to say it's 100 millimeters, these represent the same physical phenomenon. Okay, notice that when the size of the unit gets smaller, go from centimeter to millimeter, this is a smaller unit. The size of the number gets bigger. They, they go opposite one another. So what I'm trying to give you is a taste of, we're on our way to estimation. If you can estimate uh, the uh, answer to a problem, then you're more likely to detect uh, errors in your calculations. Um, Okay, there's enough said for that, but I'll bring it up later again. 
<clears throat> okay. So when we take measurements, you can measure things that are very, very, very small, that are what we consider normal size, that we can actually hold in our hands, or very large. Right? So if we're a microscopist, we're looking at very small things. Like I think they say the coronavirus is maybe 0.1 micrometers in size. And the distance from the earth, the average distance from the earth to the sun is 93 million miles. Now they don't tell you miles here. We're only talking about the number. What do you do with big numbers? But that's probably where they got that number. All right, so we've got a way for expressing very large numbers and very small numbers that are more compact and actually useful <clears throat> when we need to do calculations. If you have very um, a large number in this case, you can express this in uh, what we call the overarching method is called exponential notation. And it's particularly useful in the decimal system because the decimal means that you can express this number in terms of powers of 10. Because each time you move a unit, say there's your decimal, if you move a unit here, 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 you got ones, tens, hundreds, thousands. It's, it's by tens. That's the power of the decimal system. And we use that in exponential notation to reduce large numbers or change small numbers to something a little more manageable. Now, I say exponential notation is the is the overarching method because scientific notation is a subset of exponential. Exponential notation only requires that you store some of this information here in a power of 10. It doesn't matter how much. You just have to take account of, well, let's use this example, 93 million. We could say, okay, let's store uh, a thousand of this number in a power of 10. So we move the decimal over here. And then we say it's times 10 to the third. Okay. That's exponential notation. Scientific notation is a little stricter. This is called the coefficient. The coefficient in scientific notation must be between 1 and 10 always. So in order to be scientific notation, we would take that decimal and move it some more. One, two, three, so that's six, seven. That. So I've got to mute my phone. So you're going to get, get a taste of the Swedish chef. You know the Muppets? Okay, so oh, just a second. I forgot to uh, open my app. Let's see if this is uh, set up right. Well, I'll take you a look. Take too long to set it up, so I'll just. There we go. All right, <clears throat> so there's the difference between the exponential and scientific notation. It's all based upon what you have here. Okay, so we don't need that one. Um, now, we're going to get to the reason why. What happened to all these zeros? Right? Because if we've only got 9.3 here times 10 to the 7. So what happened to all those zeros? That's a slide or two next where we talk about uh, significant figures. Okay. And if you may have had that in high school, I think sometimes they discuss significant figures. <clears throat> okay. So that's expressing a large number in scientific notation. And notice that when you move the decimal to the left, power of 10 gets big, it's positive. 
because you're storing up ones, tens, hundreds, thousands in that value right there. If it was small and we moved the other direction, then you'd be actually increasing your coefficient. You'd make it bigger, so this would have to get smaller. Okay, we'll have some examples in a second. Um, oh, that's a good point. What if your coefficient is exactly 10, whether it's based upon this number, on a number or a calculation, right? If you're gonna express your answer in scientific notation, then you have to look at the answer and say, okay, is the answer like uh, 2,475 times 10 to the 10th? Well, now you've got to reduce it further to put it back in scientific notation. If you do it by hand, if you do it in your calculator, you can set it up to spit out the scientific notation as an answer. Uh, but what if your coefficient is 10? Coefficient has to be between one and 10, right? It can't be 10. If it's 10, then you gotta move the decimal again. So then you store another 10 in that exponent. Okay, uh, let's see. And the, just a reminder, the power of 10 can be positive or negative. If it's negative, that means you're, you're storing information for a very, very small number, which is equally as important. Um, okay. Uh, this is reiterating. It's, it's in, well, I was gonna say black and white, but it's kind of, uh, Gold and off white. <clears throat> okay, so here's an example of um, a number that's converted to from standard notation to scientific notation. Okay. Here's an, a small number. So when we convert this one to scientific notation, the decimal moves to the right. So if you move it one, two places, you store up a negative two in the power of 10. And then you always have to be on your guard, at least I do, that I don't make mistakes in estimation and uh, understanding how the system works is extremely important to keeping you honest. As this number gets bigger, if this number is bigger than that number right here, then that better be negative. And this one is smaller than that number, so this one is positive. It's just a, a self-check. Um, yeah, I already said that. Okay, here's a, what they call concept checks. And I get these slides from the publisher right, and modify them to suit me. So in one of my classes, I've got a, slides are from like the seventh edition of the book and we're already up to 10th edition. So my, my slides don't look anything like the cover, the new cover of the book, but I, I explained myself in the beginning. I said, I've been working on these things for several years and making modifications. You know, I'm not gonna dump all that work just so I can use their new slides. This information doesn't change. Is um, if I were in research, yeah, maybe it would change slightly from year to year, but in a classroom setting, I only give you stuff that's time tested. And I may reference uh, research for illustrative purposes later. Okay, which of the following correctly expresses this number? Right, there's our examples. All right, uh, test taking technique. With this big number, with this number positive like that, can we eliminate any of these? Yeah, throw that one out. 10 to the minus three. So now you're down to a choice of, of three. Well, if it's scientific notation, you have to throw that one out too, because that's not between one and 10. So it's either this one or that. So you look, all right, where is the decimal point? There's what I call understood and explicit decimal point. 
This is an understood decimal point. In other words, when you have a non-zero number here, you never write the decimal. Right, so the, the decimal would have to move one, two, three to the left to give you a number between one and 10 for the coefficient. So yeah, that's true, that's true. We moved it three places, has to be that. Okay. Let's see, they gave us, oh, this is a big one. A, a big, small one, I should say. Okay, we're moving the decimal to the right here. And this is an explicit decimal. It has to be because of the nature of the number. Standard notation, if we didn't have that decimal there, it, it wouldn't be the same number. And while I'm here, I'll bring up a pet peeve of mine. That decimal, all right, when, it's, when, it's, when you've got a decimal number here and there are no uh, non-zero numbers out here, you always put a zero there. You capture that decimal. I don't know where students get it. Maybe they teach this in grade school and high school that you can write a decimal with no zero to the left. <clears throat> but in this class, it's wrong. Uh, that's what I call an orphan decimal if it has no zero to the left. Okay, so now we know where the decimal is. We move it which way? One, two, three, four, five places. Five places to the right means it has to be a negative number because the coefficients get bigger. Right. So uh, negative five, well, that's the only candidate right there. We shouldn't put a negative five down here with something else in there here too. Because multiple choice tests are, their primary purpose is to confuse the test taker. That's how we get away with uh, with multiple choice rather than essay or short answer. Um, so if you don't really understand the theory and the process behind the question, then you're going to be flummoxed by any of the answers. Okay, so there's our answer. All right. Um, this is just reiterating. Numbers and units, examples. Uh, this is a good example here. Joules dot seconds. That dot means times. It's like an X. In, in the sciences, we put a dot here instead of an X. So this unit of measure is a compound unit, joule seconds. Joule is a unit of energy. And second, of course, is a unit of time. So my guess is either this is a physical constant. In fact, I think it is a physical constant. I think it's a Planck's constant. Um, or it could be from a calculation. And that brings up the other point. When you do a calculation using numbers, measurements with the, the number in the unit, you not just multiplies, divide, add, subtract numbers. You also do it to the units. The units carry through the calculation to the end. If you got the same unit in the numerator and the denominator, of course, they cancel. It's like any math uh, problem. Um, but a, a compound unit is valid as long as the calculation was done uh, properly, mathematically speaking. Uh, okay, so now we come to the unit. We talked about the numbers, how to express the numbers. We need to say something about the units because um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, nature is, is its own size. It, uh, matter just is. And when we measure it, um, we have to impose the unit upon the physical system. Well, that's okay. If I'm the only person on, in the universe, I can pick any system I want. You know, I could call it, um, uh, this is five chickens wide, I don't know, something like that. But if you're going to communicate with other people that are trying to, to tease uh, information from the natural world, 
you have to agree upon your unit of measure. So that's what this is. The SI is, it's SI, not IS, international system, but it's derived from the French. So it's, they do everything backwards in France, right? probably Canada too. So it's uh, system international, so that's why it's SI and not IS. So the SI system has these fundamental units that are agreed upon and standardized by the scientific community. Right? We have uh, this one for mass, you know, how much substance do you have? And it doesn't change no matter where you are in the universe. If you've got one kilogram, if I've got a one kilogram mass in my hand, then no matter where I go in the universe, it's still one kilogram. It doesn't matter if I'm on the moon or on Jupiter or uh, next to a black hole, it's still going to be one kilogram. That's the standard. And how do we know that the standard, how do we compare? Because you can't share one kilogram weight among millions of scientists, right? You have to have your own kilogram weight in your own lab. <clears throat> so we have a standard kilogram. And uh, everybody else's has to be compared to that one standard. Once it's agreed upon, then we have that kilogram mass. And in fact, we have one, uh, it's composed of a, an alloy of platinum and iridium, which makes it extremely inert, which is good. You don't want it to kind of corrode or it'll change the mass. And um, on top of that, it's stored in a double bell jar with an argon atmosphere inside. And it's only taken out by those who are trained to do so to make comparisons to someone else's kilogram. They want to standardize it. And they probably charge them an arm and a leg to do it too. <clears throat> but that's, and it's stored somewhere like in a, in a cave in France because the temperature is stable. Okay, so there's your kilogram mass. The length, standard SI unit for the length is a meter. Right? And everybody nowadays is kind of familiar with what a meter is. It's a little bigger than a yard. But originally, the meter was defined in terms of the distance from the North Pole to the equator on a, on a uh, meridian that passed through, um, the mine's called blank, a place in England. It's the prime degree. It's what we consider zero for navigational purposes. I'll think of it in a minute. Um, but they, they couldn't use that length as a standard. It's just too big. So they took a fraction of it. They say, what, what fraction of that distance would give us a manageable length? And they, they settled on a fraction that would give them something like that. So that's the standard meter. And then once they did that, they created out of this platinum iridium alloy, they created a bar. If, if a cross section of the bar, it looks like a, kind of like an X. Kind of like, kind of like this. cross section is kind of like that, and it's a meter long. Now, why did they choose that shape? Because it's hard to bend, <laughs> right? If you bend your, uh, your meter stick, right, then it's kind of, it's pretty hard to, to compare it to anything. So they chose that shape as a cross section, and there's your meter. Now, um, they probably still have the original stored in France in a, in a double bell jar like, like the mass. But now you can, uh, modern technology uh, enables you to determine the exact length of a meter in your own laboratory. All you need is money and the, and the, and the device that will do it. And now it's based upon uh, so many wavelengths 
of a laser light of a particular color from a particular element. Right? And the device takes that into account. It spits out, there's your meter. Uh, second is the standard for time. That's sort of grandfathered in. Right? Before modern science came along, it was pretty much agreed upon what one second was. We just had to standardize it, say, right, this is what a second is supposed to be, then we will adjust everything else to match that. And that will be our standard. Uh, temperature is the Kelvin. Now, don't fret. Everybody knows what Fahrenheit is for weather purposes. And all sciences use Celsius as their measuring temperature. Right? Well, the Kelvin is the exact same size unit as the Celsius. The difference is where's your zero point? In Celsius, the zero point is the freezing point of water. And then the 100 is boiling point of water. Well, Kelvin just takes that zero and goes down to absolute zero. Right? So the beauty of the Kelvin is there are no negative numbers in the Kelvin system. And that's important for calculation purposes. That doesn't become obvious when we get to uh, like the gases. It'll probably, I'll remind you when we get to gases. Okay, electric current is the ampere. Um, well, I don't, we're not going to use this in this class, I don't think at all. The ampere is um, uh, one coulomb per second passing a given point. That's current. So you probably ask yourself, what's a Coulomb? Well, it has its definition too. Uh, amount of substance, we are gonna use this one, the mole. And I think the, the mole is, um, the name is derived from molecule. And what it is, is just how many things are there. And it's, it's based upon um, a physical phenomenon. So it can be verified. And has been calculated, recalculated over the years and refined to like an infinite number of decimal places. So that tells you how many things you have. For instance, um, how many atoms are uh, in the sponge? Okay. Probably several moles, because a mole is a huge number. And I'll remind you of that later. Okay. These are all fundamental units. We can take these and derive other units from them. Okay, derived units require that we prefix um, most usually this one, this one, this one, and this one. Prefix it with um, a letter that has a meaning. It either means multiply by something or divide by something, make it bigger or make it smaller. So for practical purposes, if we're working on a scale of, uh, uh, well, we're in textiles and we're making sports clothing with nanofibers. Right? What's a nano? A nano means 10 to the minus ninth. So 10 to the minus ninth meters is the size of those particles in, in that range. Right? If you're working on that scale, you need a unit that fits the scale. So we would prefix it with a small n. So nm means nanometer. Um, if we're talking about the size of a planet, right? we may prefix this one with uh, a mega or even a giga gram. And that brings up the, if you haven't already wondered, right? this looks like it should be the base, the fundamental unit, gram, because kilo means 1,000, right? K is times 1,000. What's wrong with my marker? Is it pooping out on me? Let's see. That's better. So, that looks like a big K, doesn't it? There we go. 
Well, <clears throat> the reason that the fundamental unit is a kilogram and not a gram, because grams were grandfathered in also. I mean, alchemists knew what a gram was. But when modern science came along and needed to standardize it, they had to start with a gram. Well, the gram was too small. If you make that platinum meridian cylinder of that size, all you need is to sneeze on it <laughs> or just have a scratch of some kind and it's ruined. Because on a percentage basis, what you've done to it is changed its mass by 20, 30%. So you say, okay, we're gonna make it bigger, make a kilogram. Right? So it's, it's big enough. So if you do get a fingerprint on it, it doesn't change it that much on a percentage basis. So that's why this one is kg and not g. Uh, okay, so let's move to the next slide. We'll get our prefixes for uh, for changing the fundamental units to something that we can use, uh, depending on whether you're talking about large things or small things. Now, your book probably references a base unit. Sometimes the base unit and the fundamental unit are one and the same. But uh, in the, in the uh, case of mass, the base unit would be G. Right? And then we would prefix it. So the fundamental unit for mass is kilogram, but the base unit for all masses is G, gram. So if we put a K in front of it, that's equal to a thousand grams. If we put a um, put a big M in front of it, that's ten to the sixth grams. Okay. So notice that as this, let's see. Yeah, the size of the unit's getting bigger this way. And um, if you use these prefixes, you're getting smaller. Deci means a tenth of, and it's a little d. Uh, little c means centi, right? Everybody knows centimeter, right? It's a hundredth of a meter. Millimeter is a thousandth of a meter. Micrometer. Right, now we're getting down to the uh, uh, into the microbiology class, studying small things like bacteria and fungi. The micrometer is a millionth of the base unit, and I already talked about nanometer. Okay, so you need to know what these mean, what each one of these means. Now these are English letters, right? Either capital or small. When you get down to this one, that's the Greek mu, pronounced mu. And for our purposes, it just means 10 to the minus six. All right, let's see. If our fundamental unit is the meter, Okay, examples. Here's one meter. Here's a kilometer. Right? Distances, highway distances in every place else in the world, I believe, pretty sure, measured in kilometers. In this country, we measure things in miles. Now, you'll notice that on your uh, um, speedometer in your car, it's measured off in two different units. Right, miles per hour and kilometers per hour. Okay, and you notice that they're not the same numbers. If you're going uh, 55 miles an hour, I think that's 100 kilometers an hour in that neighborhood. It's about 1.6. So if you've got a kilometer per hour times 1.6, you'll have miles per hour. 
That's because the kilometer is a smaller unit of measure than the mile. But it's based upon this fundamental unit of the meter. Whereas a mile is just sort of has a historical significance, but you have to know what the conversion is, 5,280 feet or 1,760 yards. Or if you're, if you're a seagoing person, you, you won't even use those. In fact, the mile, the statute mile is 5,280 feet, but the nautical mile is bigger. So if you're on the oceans or if you're a pilot, you speak in terms of either nautical miles or knots for your speed. So an airplane's going so many knots, um, nautical miles uh, per hour is actually faster than miles per hour. Okay. So uh, let's see, examples, right? Decimeter is a tenth of a meter. We've been over that before. Let's go to the next one. Okay, volume is a derived unit based upon some fundamental unit. Uh, if we say this cube is one cubic meter, remember what I said, if you're, if the sides, right, height, depth, length, multiply those together, equals one cubic meter, right? We multiply the one times one times one, and then the meter times the meter times the meter is meter cubed, okay? So you have to multiply the units and the numbers. So this volume is based upon that fundamental unit of meter. This is a cubic meter, right? Well, a cubic meter is kind of a big unit, right? In the laboratory setting, you can speak, we don't measure things in cubic meters. We need something a little more manageable. So if we take a, a tenth of that size, say a tenth of a meter, a decimeter here, a decimeter there, a decimeter there, and make that our volume key, our volume unit, that turns out to be one liter. And we have a feel for what a liter is. Right? We know what a two liter bottle is like. Um, and everywhere else in the world, everything's sold by volume. When it's sold, it's sold by the liter. That's how they can get away with charging so much for gas. Because the liter is small. It's about, it takes, um, if you look on a, a gallon milk jug, like 3.8 liters equals one gallon. We buy gas in the gallon. We bought it in liters. Uh, they could creep the price up, and where you'd be paying like twenty bucks a gallon if you did the math. Um, okay, so liter is a more useful unit of measure, but sometimes even that's too big. Right? If we're going to measure small volumes, like maybe we need something smaller. So if we take this one again and go a tenth of a decimeter, right, cubic decimeter, see that little yellow thing right there? That's over here. So a tenth of a decimeter would be uh, a centimeter. A decimeter is a tenth of a meter, and a centimeter is a hundredth of a meter. So it's actually a tenth of a decimeter, like a tenth of a tenth is a hundredth of a meter or uh, a tenth of a decimeter. So if you take that one and do one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter, then what you get is one centimeter cubed. And some sciences use that, particularly if you're talking about solids, like the, the mining industry, for instance. But if you're talking about liquids, we tend to say milliliters. And it turns out one cubic centimeter is one milliliter or one thousandth of a liter. Okay. This one liter has a thousand of those cubes in it. So one milliliter times a thousand would be a liter. 
And this is important to remember, that unit, one cubic centimeter is one millimeter, exactly. Now, if you've, if you've ever been in hospitals, um, hospitals that have been around for a while, and you know somebody there that will show you around, they might show you some old stuff in some storeroom. It may still be usable. I mean, especially if it was hermetically sealed, sterilized, and you could still use it. Uh, particularly syringes. Uh, I've seen old syringes that were marked off in units of measure, and they were marked off in CCs. Right? A CC is a cubic centimeter. Right? It's easier to print CC on a syringe barrel than it is centimeters cubed. <laughs> the uh, for the type, the typesetter, it's a little difficult to get that three in there. So they just say, all right, let's make it easy. CC. Everybody knows what a CC is, cubic centimeter. Nowadays, they're marked off in milliliters, M, big L. And that's important. Big L is liter. Little L is nothing. Okay. So that's why it's little M, big L. So there was no problem with changing from cubic centimeters or cc's to milliliters because they're exactly the same size. Okay. Uh, let's see. And this is a, these are derived units. The liter, cubic meter, milliliter, cubic centimeter. They're all derived. They're not fundamental. The fundamental unit is a meter. But that's the, the values of uh, the SI system is that all units are interchangeable. I mean, they can be derived and the calculations can give you uh, other derived units. Uh, for instance, um, anybody had physics? You know, Newton's second law, remember what that is? Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration, right? Take my word for it. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, mass, the, the unit for mass is kilogram, right? Okay. How about acceleration? Everybody know what acceleration is? It's a change of velocity over time. And velocity is the change in distance over time. Right? So acceleration is going to be meters per second squared. Because meters per second is velocity. And you're changing velocity over time. So there's another time term in there. Right? So this kilogram per meter per second squared is equal to this unit of force. So we could use that, but in honor of Isaac Newton, this is called one Newton. If you have one of those, one of those. Right? So we can derive other units of measure. Um, if you pay attention to the rocket industry right now, particularly SpaceX, they're the most noteworthy, Elon Musk's company. When they say this rocket, or they say about any rocket, this rocket produces so many newtons of mega newtons of thrust right, at takeoff. That's where it's derived. That's what a newton means. It's a measure of force. Now, for our, for our um, jet fighters, we still uh, measure force in pounds, pounds of thrust. But you can interchange those values also. All you need to know is what's the equivalence between um, one system and the other. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that also. Um, call it the fancy name is dimensional analysis. Unit conversion. Okay, uh, let's see. Mass. All right. This is an analytical balance. It's good to four decimal places, which means uh, one ten thousandth of a gram. 
So what's a, a thousandth of a gram would be a milligram. So if we've got uh, four places instead of three, that means uh, it's good to a tenth of a milligram. Okay, there we have an equivalence. One kilogram is equal to 2.2046 pounds. Now, I don't, I don't know if you see the problem with that, but kilogram is mass. And pounds is weight. Mass doesn't change no matter where you are in the universe. Weight is a force. It depends on what's the gravity well you're in. Are you on the earth? Are you on the moon? Are you close to a black hole? That will change. So in order for this to be equal, it has to be on the surface of the earth with what we call 1G acceleration. You've heard of Gs before, right? right. The best sports cars in the, in the world well, on a, on a tight curve, we'll give you close to 1G. So you'll feel 1G pulling you to the outside of the curve. But most family cars, maybe they're lucky to get two tenths of a G before their tires break loose. Okay, so I'll, I'll call your attention to that again later. Um, so what have we done here, right? We've got the force here, pounds, and now we've got grams instead of kilograms. So all you have to do is just say, all right, um, if we're gonna have grams here instead of kilograms, how many grams is that? Well, look at the prefix. What's that prefix equal to? A thousand. So one times a thousand, is a thousand grams is equal to this many pounds. Okay, but we want this to be one. So how do you get something to be one? You divide by itself, don't you? In mathematical terms, if we want to be kosher anyway, we have to divide both sides by the same number. Right? If we do that, then everything's fine. You won't cause your high school math teacher to roll over in her grade. So if we do that, 2.2046, 2.2046, like that, then this becomes one, and this 2.2 into 1,000 becomes 453.59. like when, when you get comfortable doing that kind of stuff, it gives you a sense of power. Look what I can do. Okay. Uh, which of these statements contain improper use of commonly used units? Doesn't make sense. So if we say a gallon of milk is equal to about four liters, that's about right. I, I gave you the exact amount earlier, 3.8 liters. A 200 pound man has a mass of about 90 kilograms. Let's see, let's do estimation. 2.2 um, pounds is about a pound. So 2.2 times this would be, let's see, two times that would be 180, and then a tenth of it would be nine, and 18 would be 18, yeah, it's close to 200. So that one's okay. How about this one? The basketball player has a height of seven meters. <laughs> you know any basketball players that are uh, nine yards tall? <laughs> no, I don't either. So that one doesn't fit. How about a nickel is 6.5 centimeters thick? So you have to think about what, what's a centimeter? Uh, actually, a centimeter is maybe uh, like this between these two lines. It's about a centimeter. I know two and a half centimeters is an inch. 
So if an inch is maybe like that, that would be about right. Six and a half centimeters, but I don't know any nickels that are that thick. So estimation tells you that only these top two are valid and these bottom two are not valid. That I always remember for reason. scribbles. Well, the next slide will be messed up. <clears throat> okay. Here's a convention among scientists when they see a measure. And if if you want to feel free to interrupt me, right? If something just doesn't make sense, or if a question clicks, don't let it fade. It's probably not as big a problem for you as it is for me. If I don't, if, I, if a question pops into my mind, I better work on it right then, or three seconds later, it's gone. This old brain syndrome. <clears throat> but uh, if, a, if another scientist sees your measurement, it's understood to be composed of certain numbers and an uncertain number. That's just by convention. It's to take into account the fact that all measurements have uncertainty. And, and to prove that to yourself, all you have to do is take something and ask uh, five people to measure it. And they can use the same stick, meter stick, to measure it. And it's rare that they'll all come out, any two of them will come out with the same answer. There's always uncertainty in measurement. So what we're trying to do is deal with it. How do you get a handle on it and control it? Okay, so we have this concept of certain versus uncertain digits in a number. And it's really simple. If we say that the length of this pen is 2.85 centimeters, it's understood by every scientist who's not a dunce, that these first two from left to right are certain. In other words, there is no uncertainty in these two numbers. It's units of two and tenths. Those are good. The last one is always the uncertain. So if you meant to write this number with more decimal places, Say um, you want the number to represent 2.850, you want to go to the thousandths unit, then you expect that five to be certain. And in order to make it certain, you've got to put something else out here. Now the five is certain. And it's understood that the last place uh, from left to right is the uncertain number. The kind way of putting it is the last one is a guess. Uh, um, excuse me, it's actually a guess. The kind way of putting it is the last one is an estimate. Now, how do you know which, when you're making a measurement, how do you know which ones are certain and which ones are, uh, the last one is uncertain? Well, if your device is marked off for actual values, you should consider those measurements that you take anywhere near those numbers as certain. And then the last one, since there's, there's nothing past this one, let's see, this would be two, between two and three, there you go. And then we look a little closer, uh, between two and three, you're over here close to eight, right? This would be eight, this would be, this would be 0.8, this would be 0.9 right here. So it's between. Actually, I just blew my, that's not a good slide to make this discussion because this is actually marked off. So these are all certain because you've got a five there, right? So this one, that should be the value based upon my argument because there's actually a place there for that five. 
So that is a certain number. The last one you estimate. Well, it looks like it's right on the five, so I'm going to put a zero there. If it was moved over a little bit, either side, it would say over here like this, I might say 855. The last one is an estimate because there's no mark on your measuring device for that last place. Okay. Any, did I confuse anybody with that one? Okay. Okay. Um, now, we're still on the topic of uncertainty, but there are two types of uncertainty. The first type of uncertainty is called accuracy. How close is your measurement to the true value? If you know what the true value should be, then you can take one measurement and say, it's accurate or it's not accurate. Is it close to it? Is it way far away from it? But in reality, we rarely know what the true value is. We have to back up a step and say accepted value. So an accepted value is something that's agreed upon by two or more people. Or even if you're doing it yourself in your own lab, you, you make the same measurement over and over and over, over a period of months and years, and you take an average, and you get a value that you consider accepted. And then you measure, and anytime you make a single measurement, you say, is it close to that number? That's the accepted rather than the true. Precision, on the other hand, is, how tight are your multiple measurements grouped? Are they very close together? Or are they very far apart? Okay. And uh, they represent two different concepts. In popular literature, and news programs and whatever, they interchange these. They just mess them up. They'll say, um, trying to sound scientific, They'll say something, this is, this is a precise measurement when they mean accurate. Okay, what about this one? Let's say, anybody here shooter, hunter? Okay, so before you um, go out and the season opens, you're going to take your, let's just say for argument's sake, it's a rifle with a scope on it. You're gonna take your rifle to the range or some safe place and uh, step off a distance that you assume is going to be roughly the distance between you and the target, whatever you're hunting. Uh, and then you set up your target and you take three shots. Well, okay, let's take four. Four shots. All right. What you want is for those four shots to be grouped tightly together. They don't have to be on the bullseye, just as long as they're tight together. Then you can make adjustments on your scope and take four more shots. And hopefully, and eventually, that group will be on the bullseye. <clears throat> okay, in this case, this is not a tight grouping. Right? So it's not precise. But if we take the average of these four, the average is right on the bullseye. That is an accurate group. Right? So it's accurate, but not precise. What about this one? Well, it's the average is not on the bullseye, so it's not accurate. But the grouping is reasonably close together, so we would call that precise. This one, it's hard to see, but there are four of them right on the bullseye. So this one is both accurate and precise. And then the last one. Let's see, where are they? I don't see them. Oh, here's, here's one. There's one. There's one. And there's one. Okay. If you take the average of these guys, it's going to be over here somewhere. 
So this one is neither accurate nor precise. If you're scoping in your rifle, you want, in the beginning at least, you want uh, precise, and then you can move it to make it accurate. This would be ideal, right? <laughs> Put four shots inside a, a quarter at 300 yards, it's pretty good shooting. Okay, now, <clears throat> uh, I mentioned earlier significant figures. Significant figures had to do with uh, keeping track of uncertainty in your numbers and in your calculations. But first, before we do a calculation, we've got to say, how do we know the, the, uh, whether these numbers are certain or uncertain in a value? Well, we group those, those together in what we call significant figures. How many of those represent significance to that number? And how many don't represent significance? Because once we know that, then we can do calculations and uh, determine how many of those places can we maintain or retain in the answer. Okay. So here are the rules. All non-zero integers are significant. So if you have a number that's, right, you got four non-zero numbers there, they're all significant. So we have four significant figures in that number. And what else do we have? Well, there's non-zero and then there's zeros, right? So the zeros come in three different flavors or classes working from left to right, all leading zeros, uh, that precede non-zero digits are not significant. So remember that decimal number with all the zeros to the left? None of those zeros are significant. Here's another example, right? There's your decimal. It's, it's preceded by a zero, which is good. And then there's another zero before you get to the first non-zero number. Those two zeros are not significant. They're just placeholders. <clears throat> so this number only has two significant figures. Then there are zeros that are captive. They're surrounded by non-zero numbers. Those zeros are always significant. It doesn't matter how many you have. Uh, in this case, you got one, right? but you could expand that if, if the number called for it, if the measurement called for it, you could move that seven out here and put three or four zeros in there. They'd all be significant because they're uh, bracketed. They're captivated by non-zero uh, numbers. Okay. Those are significant always. And then there are zeros to the right of non-zero numbers. It depends. Where is the decimal point? Right. Is there an explicit decimal point in that number? If there is, then these zeros are significant. Their place holding for this last one is uncertain. That one's certain, that one's certain, that one's certain. Okay, if you have an explicit decimal, then zeros to the right are significant. But in this case, you don't have an explicit test. You left it out. That zero is not significant. So this one only has two significant figures. Now, how would we make that one? Say it was a mistake. I meant to say that all three of those numbers were significant. All three of those digits. Put an explicit decimal there. Now you have three significant figures. Okay. All right, <clears throat> then there are exact numbers. These numbers have infinite significant figures. Now, why would we even worry about that? Well, when we get to do calculations, the number of significant figures in the terms in the calculation make a difference on the outcome. So if you've got some, um, 
exact numbers in there, it doesn't matter what their significant figures are. Because they've got as many as you need. So they don't limit the significant figures in your answer. These exact numbers, um, any counting number, uh, here we go, like nine pencils, that's got infinite significant number of figures. And uh, conversion factors, where you have an equivalent, like 2.54 centimeters in one inch, that 2.54 has infinite significant figures. We'll talk about conversion factors more in just a minute. Okay, so the author should say here scientific notation. There's a difference between exponential and scientific. So how would you write a number in scientific notation? Well, you want to retain in your coefficient all of the significant figures of your number. So if our number has a decimal here, in this case, then you must keep those two. So if you move the decimal to the left two places, store that information here, then your coefficient will retain 3.00, retain three significant figures. Without that, you can only say three times 10 squared because those two don't matter, okay? Um, yeah, if you write your, your if you convert standard notation to scientific notation and you do it correctly, then in order to determine the number of significant figures in your number, you only have to look at the coefficient. It will retain the significant figures for you. Uh, let's see. And especially if you have a number like 93 million, and remember it had no explicit, explicit decimal to the right. So all of those zeros were not significant. That's why it was only 9.3 times 10 to the seven. Uh, and you can get rid of all those zeros when you write your scientific notation. And the same thing for very small numbers, right? All those zeros to the left are not significant. So wherever your decimal ends up, uh, it doesn't have any leading zeros in it. Okay, suppose your calculator tells you that your answer is uh, 3.46029 times 10 to the 12. Right? But the rules of calculation that we're going to give you in just a minute, the rules of calculation say your answer can only have two significant figures. Now, your calculator is not wrong. It just doesn't know the rules. Right? It's going to retain everything and spit out everything that you tell it to. So if we have two significant figures, we can have this one and that one only. That means we look to the right of this one. That's five or greater. This one has to be stepped up. So it's 3.5 times 10 to the Okay. When you do rounding, you always look, you have to decide how many significant figures can I keep? And then you look to the right of the furthest right one that you can keep. One, two, we look to this one. These don't matter. It's just that one. Okay. You don't round this one up to three and round that one down to zero and then round this one to six. In this case, it would work, but that's not the way you do it. You look just to the right, the first one to the right. And that's probably what we're going to get in the slide. There are a number of ways to round, right? But this is the simplest way, and this is what we're going to use. Okay. Um, we don't need to labor that one. Uh, we will say this. If you have um, a series of calculations, especially if they're multiply, divide, or exponential, um, based on the rules of calculation, K 
carrier as many decimals as your calculator will give you all the way to the end of the calculation and then round at the end. The reason you want to do that is because if you round for each step and you round up, 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 your answer is going to be way off from where it should be. But if you, if you hang on to all those decimals, then when you get over here around it, then you're right on target. Now that's only for multiply and divide. For add and subtract, we've got another set of rules that have to be incorporated into your calculation first. And we're going to talk about those right now. Mathematical operations. There are two types, multiply and divide, and that includes exponents. Uh, and add and subtract. Multiply and divide is the easy one. All you have to do is, in your calculation, you say which one has the least number of significant figures. And that's the limit on your answer. So this one has four, this one has two. Our calculator may spit this number out, but we have to round to the two. Okay? And subtract requires that you line up the decimal points whether they're explicit or understood, line up the decimals and do the operation. And when you do that, like for this one, line up the decimals, add everything up, and then you're limited by the least number of decimal places in the operation. So this one is only good to the hundred, uh, hundreds place. So you have to round that five makes this eight. 31.28 is your answer there. Let's see, what if uh, what if we have numbers that, that don't have decimal places in them, explicit decimals? For instance, let's go back to that 150. And let's add uh, 75. Okay, so we line up our implicit understood decimals here, okay? And then we add them together, okay? Now, how many places can we keep for significance? That one's not significant. Okay? So we have to say, round it up. So it's two, two, oops, sorry, two, three, but we have to put a zero here because it's a placeholder. If we drop that zero, then it's no longer 200, it's 23. So we have to keep a zero, but we don't put a decimal in because that zero is not significant. So that's how you deal with numbers that don't have explicit decimals in them. Now, we had a decimal there. You can keep everything right there. I need to incorporate that into my slides to have to do it freehand every time. Okay. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Now, uh, as a practical matter, when you're in the laboratory and you're making measurements, Say so you have to combine measurements in some form or fashion. In this case, we're combining volumes. We're combining this volume with that volume. What determines the limit on your significant figures? What determines the accuracy of the outcome? It's determined by the least accurate instrument in the series. Right? So if you've got a volume measured with this one, which you marked off in uh, let's see, 200s, right? 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.7. Two, four, six, eight. Yeah, okay. So each one of these marks is two tenths. But in this one, each one of these marks, uh, excuse me, two hundreds. Each one of these marks is two tenths. Which one's more accurate? That one's more accurate. But this one limits the outcome. So if we say this one is, and I think that's going to be off based upon what, what I've told you so far, 
This one would be point between point two and point three, and that's eight tenths. So it'd be point two eight zero. Right, because the last one is an estimate. And this one will be 2.80. Then when you add them together, right? You can't keep this one. So actually it should be 3.08 instead of 3.1. But if we if we said we could only keep two, then we would have to round this one up to three point one. But you're probably asking yourself, all right, so the mistake was made on that slide. How's that going to impact answer on a test? <laughs> if you remember this procedure and you mark the answer according to these rules. Not 3.1, but 3.08. And I mark you wrong, then you've got an argument in your favor. So all you have to do is remind me that, yeah, but you said this. Okay, yeah, give you credit. I try not to do that because it messes up grading, but um, I, I've told my students from the very beginning. Um, any mistake that I make will not impact your grade. And for that matter, any mistake that the college makes, if it has a bearing on your grade, I won't incorporate that into a penalty. So what I want is that the assessments that are done, and quizzes and whatever, um, are reflective of your performance, not incorporating my mistakes. Okay, so if I make a mistake, if I have a lousy question, then I'll just give everybody credit for that question. For example. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, conversion factors. All right. Okay. Now, like I said, nature just does what it does. A physical object, when we measure it, or a phenomenon when we measure it, um, doesn't care what your units of measure are. It doesn't care what your measurement is. It just is. So maybe we measure it in one system and we want to change it over to another system. Or we want to stay in the same system and just use different measurement units. We do that with conversion factors. In order to to know what the conversion factor is from one unit of measure to the other, you need an equivalence. What is this measurement equal to in the other system? When you have an equivalence, then you have a conversion factor automatically. And I'll show you how that works. Let's see. Um, uh, example. Uh, they say a golfer has putted, putted a ball at 6.8 feet across from the, from the hole on the green. How many inches does this represent? What's our conversion factor? We know our conversion factor is what's equal to a foot in inches? 12 inches. Okay, there's our conversion factor. Well, if we're going to convert 6.8 feet to yeah, I've got that. Let me move this out of the way. If I'm going to convert that to inches, I need something in here, a conversion factor that will cancel feet and give me inches. So my uh, equivalence is this. How do I need to arrange that equivalence so that it will give me inches? Right? Any number sitting off by itself is in the numerator. Right? It's understood to be like that. Okay, that's math. 
So if I put feet in the denominator times feet in the numerator, they cancel, right? So that means I need inches in the numerator. So if this one says inches is on top, this one says feet on bottom. So how do I get my <coughs> conversion factor in here like that? Well, first of all, if I've got an equivalence here, that has to be equal to one. Right? You can't multiply it by some other number and expect it to be equal. That has to be one. You can multiply anything by one, that's kosher. So we've got, this is our conversion factor and I want feet on the bottom. So why don't I divide both sides of the equation by feet? Okay, that's kosher. Well, what's one foot divided by one foot? One. So one equals 12 inches per foot. And if this is one, I can substitute that equality, that equivalence in here. Now I can get rid of the 12 times 6.8 is 82 inches. That's why conversion factors work, because every conversion factor is equal to one. So that being said, suppose we needed more than one conversion factor. Say I only know uh, two or three different equivalences, relationships, and none of them get me from where I am here to where I want to be. Doesn't have to be feet and inches to be anything. Right? Well, I can chain them together because this times one times one times one times one is perfectly legal. And then once I know what the one is equal to, shove it in there. And as long as it cancels units and leaves me with another one that could be canceled by the next one, as long as I get where I'm going, I'm happy. I didn't break any laws. All right. Um, oh, significant figures in our answer. What is this? This is a multiply divide, isn't it? And this one is an exact number so it doesn't matter this has two significant figures so my answer has to have two for multiply divide remember add subtract we have to line up the decimals is that coming from outside okay let me see i didn't open my hard copy so um, i think i've still got a few to go All right, so in this case, um, we have an iron sample that has a mass of four and a half pounds. That's inaccurate to begin with. But right? pounds is not mass. In fact, in the English system, mass is in slugs, but nobody ever uses that, except maybe engineers. But we're gonna, for argument's sake, for now, we're gonna say on the surface of the earth, we're gonna say this is a mass, four and a half pounds. What's the mass of the sample in grams? Well, in this case, we don't have a unit that will convert pounds to grams, right? right? Kilograms to grams and kilograms to pounds, right? If you remember that earlier slide, of course, you know what it is. It's 454 grams per pound. But let's say we don't know that. But we can use these two equivalences to create conversion factors and chain them together. So there's four and a half pounds and cancel the pounds, it leaves us with kilograms. So we've converted from English to metric system. Now we want to change kilograms to grams and that will get us where we're going. So the relationship to one kilogram is a thousand grams. Why? Because kilo means 1,000. Thousand grams. Kilo. And the rest is number crunching. 
This is the thing with car. If you think right, if you follow the rules, then the rest is up to your calculator. And this is in scientific notation. If you have your calculator set up correctly, then it'll spit the answer out in scientific notation. You may have to round it because this is exact, that's exact, this is three, and they're all multiplies. So you have three significant figures in your answer. Okay. Now here takes a little thinking. If you're gonna take a trip, in this case from New York to Los Angeles, that wouldn't be me. I would not be in New York and I wouldn't go to go to Los Angeles. I, I usually, I don't know why I did. I guess this came from the, uh, this came from the publishers. But when I do it in my other class, I go from Atlanta to, I mean, from Bakley to Atlanta because I have relatives there. But for argument's sake, let's say we want to go from New York to Los Angeles, right? What information do you need to know in order to get there and back? It's going to take money, right? You got to have enough money. And most of the money you spend in the trip, anyway, is going to be for driving. So you need to know how much does gas cost? How far is it? And how much does a gallon of gas cost? That's the hard part because you're traveling through several time zones in the States, so you're gonna have different costs. So you sort of have to estimate. And you estimate on the high side, right? You don't wanna run out of money in your trip to be stuck out in the middle of nowhere. So um, the distance is 2,500 miles, roughly. Let's say you got a reasonably efficient car, 25 miles per gallon. They'll be pushing it from my van, but say you've got a small four cylinder engine, you probably do better than that now. And then the cost of gas, this is still pretty accurate. This was several years ago when it was here, and then it dropped down during the Trump years and it goes back up during the Democrats because they love inflation. <clears throat> but now, uh, based on those, values, we can use, we can convert miles to gallons, right? One gallon uh, here per 25 miles, that leaves us with gallons, and then we cancel gallons with the price of gas, and that's how much money you need to get there. Uh, double that, like $650 to get back, and then Los Angeles is a big place, so you're probably going to have to drive a lot. So you you pad your uh, amount by ten percent or more, and that's what I usually do when I estimate for Atlanta because it's a big place too. Uh, and then you have an estimate of how much money you need to either carry in your pocket or have it on your credit card, so that you can charge your gas and get there and back. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about some actual measuring systems, temperature. These are the three biggies, Fahrenheit, which came first, historically speaking, then Celsius came next, and then Kelvin followed Celsius. So Fahrenheit was a German, the person Fahrenheit was a German. He was primarily interested in living systems. He was a biologist, I think. So his system wanted to have temperature measurements in the range where living systems would be active. So uh, most living systems are active right in here, right above, above freezing and less than boiling. So right in there. Uh, and I had a physics teacher in high school explain to me uh, zero, which this is plausible, zero degrees is the coldest temperature he could come up with. Like he took rock salt and ice, right? like he was making ice cream. 
and that would be about zero degrees. So that was his bottom zero point. And then he needed a hundred degree point. Well, let's see, how did he do? He was married. So one day when his wife was hopping mad about something, he stuck the thermometer in her mouth and went up to hundred. I don't think it's true, but that was that was his story. <clears throat> anyway, for whatever reason, he established the both ends of his scale and then subdivided them. So between the freezing point of water and the boiling point of water, there are 180 units. Right? Celsius was a chemist. So he wanted something a little more physical as his uh, anchor points. Freezing point of water is zero degrees for him. 100 degrees Celsius was boiling point of water, which could be easily replicated in any laboratory. And they could, they could take his thermometer and recalibrate it if they needed to. Maybe it needed some adjustment. Uh, so uh, 32 in Fahrenheit is zero degrees in Celsius, and 212 Fahrenheit is 100 degrees in Celsius. Well. The number of divisions in Celsius is only 100 between those points, whereas it's 180 for Fahrenheit. So that means the size of the unit for Fahrenheit is smaller than it is for Celsius. By 1.8, right? 180 divided by 100. So the ratio of the units is 1.8. Then Kelvin came along, Lord Kelvin. And uh, for various reasons that I'll, I'll tell you later, he wanted a system that had no negative numbers in it at all. And he based his work upon the thermodynamic investigations of the day, uh, primarily Sadie Carnot, the Frenchman, who uh, characterized accurately the performance of a heat engine, right? And we all drive around with heat engines under our hood, the gasoline internal combustion engine. Carnot would have understood that engine perfectly. And Kelvin too. I've got the paper that Kelvin, uh, well, not the paper, <laughs> I've got a photocopy of the paper that Kelvin wrote um, outlining his system. And in order for his system to work, zero is absolute zero, nothing colder than zero. Now, as a practical matter, there's no way he could set his thermometer at zero. This is theoretical. But he established zero as absolute zero. And that means that everything on the Kelvin scale is positive. But they're the same size units as Celsius. So all you have to do is if you convert, right? 273 Kelvin is zero degrees Celsius. So if you want to convert the two, um, Kelvin is equal to Celsius plus 273. Okay. It's a little more complicated for the conversion of Fahrenheit to Celsius because not only is the zero point shifted, but the size of the unit is shifted. And I'm not sure if I, if I put it in this slide set. Yeah, I did. This uh, website will give you a, a good explanation of how the formula for the conversion of Fahrenheit and Celsius is derived. Okay, so we won't have to spend time with it here. If you're curious, go there and it's a good explanation. All right, let me go back. Okay, so. Um, the conversion, well, actually, I do need that next one. Here's the conversion of Celsius to Kelvin. So Celsius plus 273 is Kelvin. But if you know, this is the one I memorized as a kid. I think it was grade school, learned that one. Uh, Fahrenheit is equal to nine fifths Celsius plus 32. That's the way I learned it. Nine fifths is 1.8. And if you know this relationship, um, if you know Celsius, just plug the number in and calculate Fahrenheit. But if you know Fahrenheit, you need to use a little algebra. Plug in Fahrenheit and solve for Celsius or solve for Celsius first 
and then plug Fahrenheit value into the new formula. And the new formula looks like this. Okay. So is everybody comfortable with algebraic manipulations? Yeah. Practice, practice. <clears throat> okay. Um, what if you're given a Fahrenheit and the answer should be Kelvin? Convert to Celsius and then convert to Kelvin. That's one way. Or if you if you like to, if you like algebra, you say, okay, um, I want Kelvin. Let's solve this equation for Celsius. Right? So it's going to come out like this. It's going to be uh, Fahrenheit minus 32 divided by 1.8. And then you take that value plug it in there, so it's this plus 273, and you can just plug in Fahrenheit and get Kelvin. Okay, that's a substitutionary way. Either way is valid. <clears throat> okay. So, normal body temperature for a dog is 102. That's about right, 102, 103. They're hot. You pick up and hug your dog when you're cold. It keeps you warm, doesn't it? Or they climb into bed with you in the winter. <clears throat> so what's the equivalent temperature in Kelvin? Well, we need to convert to Celsius, right? You're gonna do it for us? Yeah, there we go. Okay. And then once we get Celsius, we plug 102 in here. Oh, that is right. Duh. And then we take that value, which is 39 degrees Celsius and 273, and we get 312. Okay. What's the Celsius normal body temperature? Well, first in Fahrenheit, 98.6, right? Okay. What it is, is it in Celsius? We could do the calculation. Or I've already got it memorized. It's exactly 37 degrees Celsius. That's normal human body temperature on the average. Okay. You rarely get that temperature anymore because they're measuring oral or uh, skin contact. Or now they're not even contact anymore. They're, me they're measuring the infrared signature of your body and correlating that to temperature which is always less than uh, internal body temperature. What's the only way to get internal body temperature? Drawing your blood. Drawing your blood? Yeah, that would work. Or we do. a rectal thermometer. <laughs> That's the way you do it? In, in the lab. I work in the lab. Sometimes. Okay. And every single faucet or tube of blood has to be drawn on 37 degrees Celsius. Uh-huh. You knew the answer. Why didn't you say so? <laughs> I don't mind if you steal my thunder. Um, any of my former students will tell you, if you don't speak up, I'll just keep right on talking. Sometimes I don't even stop when the class is over. <clears throat> okay, here's another interesting question. Since they have different units for Celsius and Fahrenheit, that means they're on a different slope and eventually their lines will cross. So at some point, Celsius and Fahrenheit numbers for those units will be equal. So how do we do that? Well, algebra again. Right? Let's say if they're equal, if the degrees Celsius is equal to degrees Fahrenheit, and by the way, notice Kelvin had no degree sign. It never does. It's just to 273K. If they're equal, then we can say uh, each one is equal to X. X is our unknown. So if we plug X into this formula, <coughs> like this, there we go, right? If they're equal, then they have to be equal to the same, same value. Solve for X. And it turns out X is minus 40. So at minus 40 Celsius, 
you're also minus 40 Fahrenheit. Okay? And I know what that temperature is like. I know exactly how it feels. When I was an undergraduate, I was working at a, a hotel restaurant institutional supply house. Like we had uh, dry goods, like canned goods and paper goods for restaurants. We had uh, a meat section in the cooler where they would custom cut meat, and grind, make patties and so forth for restaurants. <clears throat> we had a frozen section that was maintained at from minus 20, I think, Fahrenheit. And then we had a blast freezer for quick freezing those hamburger patties, for instance. Because the quicker you freeze them, smaller the ice crystals, and the better they are when you thaw them out. So we blast freeze some things. And that blast freezer, we would actually maintain product in there sometimes. Just keep it really cold. Um, I was a low man on the totem pole. Because right, I was part-time labor as a student. And once a month, we do inventory for the whole place. Dry goods, cooler goods, frozen goods, blast freezer goods. And I got to do the blast freezer. So I had this huge quilting uh, coat that hang all the way down to my ankles. And I had a hat with muffs on it and big gauntlet gloves, which kind of made writing the inventory difficult. But it really didn't matter because I could only stay in there maybe 10 or 15 minutes at a time and I have to come out the cooler and warm up. But we do that once a month. And they would feed us a high calorie breakfast before we go in there. So that was a benefit. But it was maintained at minus 40 degrees. And it was cold. The only problem was I was wearing glasses then. I have since about the eighth grade. And I, I come out from that blast freezer into the cooler and they fog up. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Oh, density. I'm missing my uh, panning there. There it is, density. So we talked about temperature. Now let's talk about density. Well, first of all, <clears throat> measurements can come and calculated values can come in two flavors. They can be uh, intensive values or they can be extensive values. Intensive values never change uh, for a given substance, no matter how much of it you have. And density is a good uh, example of that. So if I have a cup of water, the density of that water is one gram per milliliter. If I have a swimming pool full of water, the density is still one gram per milliliter. That's an intensive property, density. Temperature is an intensive property. It doesn't matter how much blood you draw, it's gonna be 37 degrees. Whether you've got uh, a thimble full or you got a bag, right? turn the vampires loose on your people, they suck a liter out. I guess that's how much is in the bag now. A unit. A unit. Is that a liter? Uh, yes. Okay. <clears throat> that's an intensive property of matter. Temperature, density. In this case, it's a single unit. But most of the intensive properties are ratios. In this case, it's it's like uh, grams per cubic centimeter, grams per milliliter. But most intensives are ratios. Extensive properties, they will vary by how much material you have. So if you have more material, you'll have more mass. Mass would be an extensive property. Now, I had a professor that preferred the, uh, the idea of factor. So he called this one an intensity factor. He called this one a capacity factor. I'm using these terms also because most textbooks talk of them in these terms rather than these terms. But um, for what's the practical application here? If you understand 
whether it's an intensive or an extensive uh, property, you know the significance of how much of the material matters. Right? If it's density, doesn't matter how much you have. If it's mass, yeah, it matters how much you have. Okay, back to the topic, density. Density is uh, related to a formula. Right? You have variables in this formula. You have density equals mass divided by volume. Okay, that's an algebraic expression. Variable, variable, variable. If you have, if you know two of those variables, you can always serve, solve for the unknown, right? That's algebra. Now, I'm never going to throw any um, two unknowns at you, right? How do you solve an equation with two unknowns? If you've only got one equation, you're stuck. But if you've got two equations and two unknowns, you know how to do it, right? Say we only knew this part, but we had another expression that we could solve uh, for this one. V equals M divided by D. Right? We know this value. Then we could solve the other one where it's MD and then plug in that V for it and solve for the others. So that's how you do two unknowns, but we're not going to do that in this class. When you solve an equation in this class, there's only one unknown. Okay, there's density. So if we know that formula, then whenever we have a problem to solve in density, we're probably going to go back to this one, at least this one, maybe some others if it's a complicated problem. For complex problems, how do you approach them? You try to simplify. In other words, break a complex problem into smaller units and then bring the units back together for your final solution. And I don't mean Nazi final solution, I mean solution to the problem. Okay, so we need to know, to calculate density, we need to know mass and volume. So mass is fairly simple to do. Right, you just put your object on a balance. I mean, even a person you put on a balance. I mean, doctors do it every day, day in and day out. Mass is easy. Volume depends on whether your object is regular or irregular. If it's a regular shape, then you have uh, formulas, geometric formulas that you can use to calculate the volume. Right? If it's a regular cylinder, right, it's the area times the height. If it's a cube, you just measure one side and cube it. Uh, if, it's an, if it's a rectangular solid, then you need to know all three dimensions and you can determine the volume. But if it's irregular, the best way to do it is by displacement. If you submerge the object in a liquid and measure before and after, you know the volume of the object. Right? As long as it's completely submerged, then the displacement here would be the volume of the object. What conditions need to be operative? Your object does not absorb any of the liquid, right? Um, and your object doesn't react with the liquid. Right? If we wanted to measure the volume of an irregular shaped chunk of sodium metal, we would not put it in water. Sodium and water react violently. They make lots of heat and hydrogen gas, which mixes with the air, oxygen and air, and there's enough heat generated that it will ignite. So in that case, you would submerge your sodium in something it doesn't react with, like the mineral oil. In fact, that's the way we store it, right? In a laboratory, if you have a, a, a chunk of sodium, it's gonna be stored in oil. So it's isolated from uh, oxygen and water in the atmosphere. And the only time that you uh, acquire any of it, you have to take it out of the oil and, and dab it off and then cut it, cut a chunk off and use it quickly. 
Okay, so by displacement, we can get volume. And notice the object has to be completely submerged. If she's got her head above water, then you're only measuring the volume from here down. You're not measuring her total volume. So you either got to tie some weights to her legs, or maybe she'll exhale some air and sink. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay, we're coming up on 11 o'clock. I think that's when. Actually, we're past 1045 is the lecture. But 11 o'clock is when lab starts. Our lab's not going to be too involved today, so we can bleed over some. Um, so if we know the mass is 17.8 grams of this mineral, and we know the volume is 2.35 cubic centimeters, it's a simple calculation. Now we know the density is 7.57 grams per cubic centimeter. And this particular mineral, as long as we don't change it, it will be that density no matter how much of it you have. You could take a subsample, you could have more of the mineral than you have in the, in the measured amount, and it'd still be that density. That's an intensive property. Uh, okay, what's the mass of 49.6 milliliters of liquid with a density of 0 0.85 grams per mil? In that case, we know this one, and we know uh, that one. We're going to solve for this one. Okay. And you always check your units. Right? If the answer needs to be mass, Uh, D times V. If the answer needs to be mass, then density grams per mil times milliliters. Right? I just left the numbers out. I'm looking at units. Right? Milliliters cancel. We're good. Our answer is in grams. Okay? Then you can plug in the numbers and do it. But if they're not in the right units, say this is. Uh, grams per mil, and you have uh, so many liters of volume. Then you have to convert it to milliliters in order for those units to cancel. Right? You can't just plug the numbers in there. You always have to be mindful of the units. Okay, 42 grams. Let's say an object has a mass of 243.8 grams and occupies a volume of 0.125 liters. Okay, there you go. What's the density in grams per cubic centimeter? Well, in this case, grams is fine, but this is not cubic centimeters. So we would convert liters to milliliters, right? 0 0.125 liters is how many milliliters? One, two, Three. 125 milliliters, right? Or 0 0.125 liters. What's the conversion factor? One liter is a thousand milliliters. So 0.125 times a thousand is 125. Okay. This is the long handed way, this is the short hand way. And once you know milliliters, do you know cubic centimeters? Yeah, they're exactly equal. There you go. Now you can plug it in the formula. Oh, I didn't do the calculation. There we go. There we go. 1.95 grams per cubic centimeter. Another interesting question, that's not on the board, but if this object were submerged in water or put placed in water, would it sink or float? You ever heard of Archimedes? He's a Greek scientist, lived in Alexandria, Egypt. And the story was that he was taking a bath and he'd been studying this problem. He says, 
why do things float? And why do some things sink? And it just dawned on him. Jumped out of his bath, butt naked, ran down the street saying, Eureka, I found it. My guess is they probably didn't take any notice because of the society he was in, plus they probably knew he was a little off anyway. But um, among other things, he, did, he proved that the density mattered. An object that's less dense than the fluid, the density of water is one gram per milliliter. And the density of the object is 1.95 grams per milliliter. It's higher, so it will sink. If it was less, say on that previous slide, uh, let's see, if it was less, 0.85 grams per milliliter, that will float. Okay, and it depends on the fluid in which the object is placed. If it's water, then you compare the density of the object to that of water. If it's mercury, then you compare the density of the object to 13.6 grams per milliliter and see if it will float. Most things will float in mercury. Okay. That's just a side note. In case a question like that pops up on a test. Um, here's the density of copper. 75 grams of copper is added to 50 milliliters of water in a graduated cylinder. What's the volume reading in the cylinder? Right. This is a multi-step problem. Right. You want to know what the volume of the copper is because the final volume is going to be 50 plus the volume of the copper. Right. And sometimes it helps to draw a picture. Right? If we've got a, a 100 milliliter volumetric flask and it's uh, 50 right here with water, then when we add our object in here, the new volume is going to be up here somewhere. Okay, So we want to know what this volume is because that will determine the added volume here. And then the answer is the total. So it's a multi-step problem. We're looking for the volume of the object. So we solve for volume, plug in the values, which, as luck would have it, will properly cancel to cubic centimeters, which is equal to milliliters. Right? So this is uh, the volume of copper, which is the volume of water displaced. So 8.37 plus 50 is 58.37 or 58.4. Okay. And we had to, when we add 8.37, according to our rules, 8.37 and then 50.0, 378. Five, then we can only keep that many, so it's 58.4 rounded off. Okay, add subtract rules. Okay, concept question. All right, we must be toward the end. You ever heard of trazodone? It's a tranquilizer. Uh, it's been around for a long time and the only reason I know about it is because I had a, a son with psychological problems. Puberty came around, he just went berserk. So we sent him to Chicago to a residential facility for a year and the physician up there wanted to use president yeah, a little bit it's sort of calming for normal people, but you need a lot more for kids with his problem. So they use trazodone for a little while. It just turns out he didn't only work for two or three doses and then it didn't work anymore. That's been the story of his life. So now uh, he rarely takes medication and, and no psychoactive medication anymore. 
So he's, he's over the hump, in other words. <clears throat> but trazodone uh, is one of those drugs that I guess could be abused. So let's say an individual took 300 milligrams of trazodone. I think he was up to 400 at one time, 450. Uh, each evening before bedtime for one year, how many pounds of trazodone would he or she consume uh, in one year? Okay, so this is a unit conversion problem, and many chemistry problems can be solved simply by unit conversion, as long as you don't violate any physical or chemical laws. And where's our starting point? Well, our starting point is 300 milligrams per day for each evening before bedtime. 300 milligrams per day, right? So 365 days per year, right? That takes care of the year time factor. And then we wanna convert milligrams to pounds. So let's see, we're given 454 grams per pound. So let's convert it to grams. Milligrams to grams. Why did I do that? Because milligrams has to cancel here and leave us with grams. So a thousand milligrams per gram. Right? And then grams per pound, 454 for one pound. So there we have how many pounds in a year. That's the hard part. That's the thinking part. Now you just go into your calculator and say 300 times 365 times 1 times 1 divided by 1 divided by 1,000 divided by 454. And there's your answer. Okay. Oops. Oh, there it is. I didn't put a box around it. I just changed the color. 0. 0.241 pounds. Now, that's the right number of significant figures because that's a conversion factor, conversion factor, conversion factor. They're all exact numbers. We only have to worry about this one. That's got a decimal, three decimal places. I mean, three significant figures, three significant figures. So a quarter pound in a year of that drug. Any questions? That's a multi-step conversion. So how did I know to do it in that order? I knew where I was starting from and I knew where I wanted to end up. And you get there by several steps. Uh, if you're given a pound of feathers and a pound of lead, the density of each would be uh, the same or different. That's the first one. Might be different, of course. We know that a pound of feathers would be like that, and a pound of lead would be like that. So that tells you that if they have the same mass, but different volume, they have different density. Okay, because not because they have the same mass, because the mass of the lead is greater than the mass of the feathers. And they have different volumes. Well, which one's which? Yeah. No, 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 the mass is not greater. No, that's wrong. The mass is the same. They have different volumes. That's the difference. They have different densities because the mass is the same but the volumes are different. So notice, what's the relationship here? If the volume increases, what happens to density? Density goes down. If you make this big, that has to get little. Right? This, think of this as a constant for any given substance. And if the mass goes up, then the volume has to go down to hold that constant. But if the volume goes up, then the mass would have to go down. Or if the mass is constant, 
then if you change the denominator, if you make the denominator bigger, then the term gets smaller. Okay. That's called an inverse relationship. Okay, I think that's it. Yeah.